My college draft is proud to announce our conference called Educate You. Educate You core areas will cover recruitment, retention, and how to build a strong alumni base of underrepresented and first generation college students. All right, welcome to another edition of the Educate You podcast being brought to you by My College Draft, where education is the new money. We have today um, Dr. Erin Wheeler, and we'll dive into her here in a second, but I always like to introduce the, my, my guys. And today we got uh, my man, David Hartman. I call him the Black Picasso. And in his uh, absence, uh, Dr. Ricky Frierson, our resident scholar. So Dr. Wheeler, you are the subject for today. Would you mind grace us with some of your background and tell us what you're doing? Yeah, so my name is Dr. Erin Wheeler. I'm from a little town called Amy, Louisiana. That's about 45 minutes uh, outside of New Orleans and Baton Rouge. So we had the best, best of both worlds, small country town. Um, and I've been in higher education since I've been in college. Education has been a really important part of my family. Um, and so coming from a small town, I've always wondered why I was one of the few Black women, few Black people that was always accelerating, um, and, you know, in honors clubs, you know, doing extracurricular things, being a leader, um, still wondering that same question of why was I one of the few um, minority students graduating from my undergrad in biology. And so this really fueled my passion to figure out what made me so special when I knew I wasn't. Mm -hmm. It was just something, uh, either strategies or background. I wanted to know what that was and what set people apart who were successful in STEM in higher education. That led me to uh, really di deep diving into helping minority students. What can universities and other support programs do to help minority students succeed in STEM. That was my research. Uh, start digging into research, learning more about uh, social emotional health, metacognition, um, and how that really played a part in how we see ourselves and how we see others who succeed. Um, and that led me down another road into this big issue of systemic inequity in higher education. It really wasn't STEM, it was higher education ethic in general. Um, so did a lot of practical work in helping um, universities improve retention rates through teaching and learning, um, academic support, uh, spent a little time in administration at an HBCU, did a lot of great work there, um, really working through diversity. It was HBCU was extremely diverse, so I had a privilege of building systems to support all types of students, ca ca Caucasian rural students who were first in their families to graduate high school and go to college to fourth generation black students who uh, whose family have been a part of higher education um, for several generations. That led me back home to New Orleans where uh, I found College Beyond who are doing the, this great work in the city to help support our students uh, through this unique, very practical way. I'm very practical. I, you know, I study and I research, um, but I um, I love the practicality, like what can we do right now to help students? I don't care about the future policies that comes with the territory, but we have students right now that need help. So um, I wanted to, uh, I love the fact that I'm working in my hometown, in my home state doing this type of work. We are 50 in the nation. Um, sometimes 49th on a good year with <laughs> Mississippi in terms of education. And so I'm just happy to be working in this field. I do this for my nine to five. I also do this as my hustle um, because this is just so important to me. So the podcast, Woke Wise College Kids, dedicated to first gen minority students. Um, my two books, Go Wiser and Live Wiser, my new book, dedicated to following uh, the same group of students, sharing my experiences. Um, and my advice for them of, of getting maximizing college experience and then dealing with life after. That's awesome. That's awesome. Again, you listen to the Educate You podcast being brought to you by My College Draft where education is the new money. I, I'm going to start with, off really simple, uh, Dr. Wheeler. Like, wh wh where'd you go to college at for undergrad and through your PhD? I went to Southeastern Louisiana University. Mm. That is a, a small regional school, and 
um, in Louisiana, in Hammond. I wanted to go to LSU. My dad said no. Glad he made that call because um, I wasn't really ready for the big, big university. <laughs> Is that where you got your doctorate as well? No, I actually went to Southern University Baton Rouge to get my master's and PhD. Right. It was a dual degree program that they they offered and uh, had that great chance to have the HBCU experience. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. Did, are you are you are you are you are you Greek? I'm just curious. I am. I am. Which, which you can't one? tell by this peak sign on the wall, though. Oh, oh, oh! I'm sorry. You, you can't let that. You can't let that fool you. I'm a Delta. That's oh. rose gold. That's rose gold. <laughs> <laughs> I won't hold that against you. Well, welcome, <laughs> welcome, my lady of DST. I'm a, I'm a alpha, so we always want to acknowledge people in the, uh, the Panhellenic, Black Panhellenic, uh, for sure. So, welcome. Thank you. Welcome, Thank you. Welcome. So I know David always got a lot of, a lot of, a lot of questions, and so. Um, but I definitely want to, first of all, I want to applaud you. And first of all, thank you so much for coming on. I've been watching you on social media and I've been watching all the, the things that you're doing unfold. I'm, I'm like, man, I got to meet you as soon as possible. And so one of the things I, you, you, you was mentioning your why that carried you all the way through, right? And so I, I'm curious that why can you talk a little dive a little bit more into it because it's uh, we always try to find that thing that motivates people to get up whether it's snow on the ground whether it's whatever is going on in your life that thing that drives you so can you dive a little bit more into that why and and how you're approaching making that why um uh, you know like a, becoming the answer to that why i'm sorry yeah so a lot of people see success no matter what area it is it's just like myth you know, mythical, superhuman type thing. And I'm like, no, it's not. It's it's all in the thoughts and actions um, that we do. And so for me, people like, oh my God, you're so smart. And then I'm like, no, I stay up late at night studying. I've been reading. All I do is read and I, you know, things don't uh, easily come to me. I have to grasp it. And, you know, I, I'm in STEM and I hate math. And I've seen, you know, my white counterparts just breeze through calculus and like, uh, okay, well, you know, catch me later. I'll be in the classroom during lunch, working problems out with the teacher. I'll be, you know, at the tutoring center trying to work out things. I'll be by myself trying to work out things. But, you know, y'all go ahead, do you. You breeze through this whole test and peace. I'll see y'all later. That was never, like, I was never that natural smart person and so that's why I was when people say oh my god you're so smart I just kind of shy away from that but it's it takes real work and I you know my mission is to say hey success is not impossible if you just have to work it and it's not out of your um you you can be you're human the 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 superhuman part of it is getting outside of your feelings and your your comfort zones and your thoughts and getting out of your own way. That's what makes people, you know, I hate when people say, oh, Beyonce and Jay-Z, they're an Illuminati. Like, no, you see this worth that, that of both of both people. Um, this doesn't come easy. She showed you her failure. She showed you how she was uh, uncomfortable and, and not confident all the time. And so it's not, it's not beyond any of us to have it. If, if I can have it, anybody can. And that's, my message that I carry to students. And when I coached them, I said, you you see your professors, don't let that fool you. They failed a couple of tests. Right. They just now learned the subject when they got up to teach you because you didn't want, they didn't want to be embarrassed by you when you asked the question. So don't be confused about the height of people right now. Look back and see what they've done right. um, and, and focus on how they have it instead of what they have. That's awesome. That's awesome. I, I want to say well, real quick, um, you in you mentioned something um, about really valuing the work in the process, right? Um, and you hear a lot, especially from an athletic perspective, um, really, really valuing what that process is, fall in love with the process, not necessarily with the end result. Um, and working, you working with um, young minorities, um, how do you try to help them get to the point to where they could fall in love with, with that process? Because it is work. As you mentioned for yourself, it has been work for me. It's also been work for uh, Lamont. So how are you helping those students try to find a way to fall in with 
fall in love with that process or with the work. So one, one I like, I love to use real life examples. And so part of that is finding who they admire, who's on their timelines right now, who's in their ears, who's on their YouTube channels. Like, who do you admire right now? I can find somebody to say, hey, you see this song, you see, you hear what they're saying, but I can show you like a whole, I can tell you a whole bunch of stories of what left them there. And, and so I try to find, you know, you know, Martin Luther King, Michael Max, you know, I, anybody we know, they might have inspired us, but the students today, they look, they have some people that we don't think are role models, but we have to, we have to show them some peer, some near peer aspirations of who they can relate to. Um, and so that's often my first, my first thing is to show them uh, the stories behind their favorite people and get them to figure out why do you admire this person? Do you know how they, ha how they um, arrived there? Do you know how they overcame some things? Um, and then take out those strategies. Um, and then on the other side, I say, what do you want out of life? What's your, what's your why? Um, can you even dream? And so what I find is that a lot of students, um, they're not even able to dream because they haven't been, when students aren't exposed to anything, they can't dream. And so I love to expose them to new things so they can dream. I've asked students, I say, close your eyes and imagine you being on a college campus. What are you wearing? What are you holding? Who are you talking to? And they have no idea but we had different world. We even had Saved by the Bell college years. That was fake, but still we could have some, <laughs> we had some idea of what college looked like. We had some idea of the car that we drove or the places. And so even when I work with students in my summer camp, um, we do a vision board and they like, oh, you've been to Italy. You've been here, you've been there. And I was like, it's like, does it cost a lot of money? I was like, it's about the same amount of money to go to Disney World is just changing your perspective. Um, and so that's that's where I usually work in with helping students to get a, get their why, ground themselves, and then keep that in front of them at all times. Say, hey, you remember when you told me that you wanted X, Y, and Z? Well, this is how you get X, Y, and Z. Um, and that's a daily reminder. Mm, that's good. Can you, can you uh, for, for us, talk about STEM and can you talk about the opportunities for young people of color in STEM? Because we, we hear about Silicon Valley a lot and there's a gap between Silicon Valley and that first, that first math class. So can you, can you talk about, you know, your, your knowledge of STEM and the benefits? Yeah. Of um, I'm sorry. If you hear my phone going off in the other room, I can turn it off. Or no, I can you do it. Okay. So, um, STEM, just like higher education, it's a lot. It, they call it a pipeline. I hate the analogy, but it sticks. It does have a start and an end point, and the start is much earlier than what we think it is. Um, but it's not impossible for students to get in the pipeline later. Um, for the pieces, so in general, you have students you know, in the early years, you get them to dream, you get them to imagine, you get them creativity and thinking outside the box. That's where STEM starts. It's with them, um, you know, even with music helps, art helps, drawing helps. It's that creativity. Once they get into elementary and middle school, especially for our Black boys and our Black girls, both have different issues, right? So the black boys are usually have been put off with math. They're probably bored out of their minds, causing trouble. Nobody can relate. They probably been had that narrative of black people aren't good in math or standardized tests here in Louisiana really put them off. Mm -hmm. Girls, you know, nobody ever tells them it's okay for a girl to be good at math or it's just different math attitudes starting in middle school age. And so that's a really ripe age for students to uh, for us to pull them in. So get them, you know, show them role models. Again, role models are, are important. Um, get them engaged in hands-on activities that represent the real science and then say, hey, you know, math is just like any sport. You have to practice it. It does not come easy to anyone. Um, and so this doesn't, this doesn't have to limit your future in STEM. There's a lot of 
there's a lot of avenues to get there. So it's in middle school is capturing that attitude for math, making sure it's positive. They see themselves in a positive light. They can see themselves as being, um, as knowing how to get through challenging things. Once they hit high school, that algebra one, that's the determining factor. Actually eighth grade, because again, algebra a little bit early, that, that area is where you see some pe some students start to peel out and show some aptitude, hate that word, show some potential for uh, science and STEM. And algebra is the crux, although there's a, a lot of applications to STEM that algebra one is the crux. Um, from there, you know, it's, it's finding out what lane they wanna go in and not just saying, oh, go into a highest paid job or whatever, or go, you know, it should be exploring some options of where they feel comfortable going. Um, black, black boys are usually into, you know, they see the game and they say, oh, I want to do computer science. And then they don't even, they don't realize that they haven't had that exposure to say, well, computer science is a lot of math. What areas do you want to go in? Do you want to actually build things? Do you want to actually program? Do you want to actually, is it the art and the graphics? Like, what is it? And so in high school, I like to uh, work with students in terms of what do you love to do outside of STEM? What do you love to do? What do you spend your time on? And then you go from there, because if you don't love what you're doing in science, you, math is going, all the challenging subjects are going to eat you alive. You just got to love it. Um, you just got to love some part of it. So I think a lot of times our students, we, we just say, hey, you know, oh, computer science is good. That's going to make you a lot of money. Go do it. Like, no, figure out what you love doing and then bring that back to STEM if you really want to be in this field. But we don't spend a lot of time with students talking about what they really want and what they could want. Um, and so that, again, goes back to how do you how do you connect the real world to education? Um, and so, you know, college is all about, again, the right fit and the right major. That first college algebra is a make or break subject. Um, but for me, helping coaching students in math courses um, is the sweet spot. If you can help them gain the skills and not and, and dismiss the myth that math comes easy to everybody, then um, that is I've seen success in that area. You just have to break that mindset. You have to break all the negative stereotypes and you know, the, they can, they, they feel like, I was like, how long have you studied? And this, they're trying to be pre-med or whatever. Uh, how long have you studied uh, for this algebra test? Oh, I mean, I did the homework. I was like, that's not gonna cut it. I don't care if you did get all A's in high school, that's not gonna cut it. So always bringing it back to time, effort and commitment. If you don't have either one, then you need to, well, it's not necessarily find another major. Another major can eat you up just the same, but you have to have that time and effort to, to match it to your outcomes. If you can't show me your time and your effort and I give you say, you need to be here and you tell me you down here, then you need to figure out a way to rise to the top. What I've learned is we, we've had a, we had a lot of black uh, male and female engineers until that first math class. So if you, can you just put on your coaching hat just for a second and coach somebody through math? Because I struggle through math. How do you approach math? Like, uh, So math is one of those things, like I said, it's a sport. I used to say, okay, who danced, who played football, who played basketball, who played music? Um, so it's this, okay, let me see the plays. We're going to be in the, you know, we're going to be in the classroom or the, the, uh, the stadium or whatever, and we're gonna go over the place generally. And then it's the time when you put on, you practice during a week. And then by the end of the week, you put on your, your, your dressed up gear, uh, you, you do your dress rehearsal, whether it's music, you put on your pads, if it's football, um, you doing something like in real time. All of that takes time, you have to hit it every day. And so for math, you have to one, do something before you actually get there. You have to get this stuff on your own terms. Most students think, oh, my professor didn't teach me nothing. They're not supposed to. They never had an education 
degree that's different your k-12 through teachers are certified educators <laughs> your college professors are not they are certified in math they are certified to teach you math um so you need to get this on you need to do some stuff on your own you need to go through the book worst and practice problems um what we call pre-work preview it could be 10 minutes it could be 10 minutes of looking at a video 10 minutes of looking at the title if you can't tell me what you're doing in class that means you have absolutely no clue of what you're doing and you're about to be confused if you can't tell me you're working on polynomials are you working on and i've blocked all calculus out of my mind since i've <laughs> If you can't tell me anything you're working on by title, if you say, well, we're doing that thing when you multiply it times three, when you multiply something, you divide it, uh-uh, get out of here. Go tell me, go look at the chapter, tell me what it is and talk to me like you're about to be somebody's math tutor. Um, and so it's about practice. Like you need to practice every day. Math is something that you can't pick up and then you can't put it down and then pick it up right next to the test. Uh, you have to value homework. You have to, uh, we, I use this strategy called using your homework, uh, getting the most out of your homework. So most students say, oh, he gave us these 50 problems to keep us busy. Like, no, this is where you learn it. So you need to do all these 50 problems once without looking at the book, without looking at solutions manual. And you need to be able to drill every problem until you say, oh, so you can reduce and say, okay, these 50 problems is four strategies. It's four strategies and there's four deviations. They might change one thing, um, but it's really four strategies or four ways of attacking it, but it's 50 problems. I can identify how to start it, what I need to do to finish it. If you can do that, you can probably pass your test. If you can teach somebody else to do it, you're absolutely going to ace the test. Um, and that's like the simple strategies uh, I have with students, but it's really about practice. They don't want to put in the work. Um, it's intimidating, um, you know, but they don't start early enough, they're cramming and it's never going to work. And so for STEM, it builds on itself. If you, if you don't get the, the, the sad part about college algebra, the first test, which most students fail, and then most teachers say, hey, you're not going to make it in STEM, which has absolutely nothing to do with anything. It's all about eighth and ninth grade math, which they haven't had if they're a first year student in five years. It's the same reason they can't do well in the ACT um, because the eighth and ninth grade math is the foundation, it's the fractions, it's the percentages. Um, and so, you know, don't be ashamed to go back and relearn this stuff. You have, no matter what it is, you have to relearn it. So um, you have to do the work, you have to practice. You can't leave this to, to any kind of, um, just like, oh, well, I got a little bit. I'm like, no, this is not it. If you really want to make it in uh, in STEM, you have to get the foundations, and you have to uh, you have to take the college algebra as seriously as you would a calculus. And so it just builds on each other. And so most of our students miss out on that because of the eighth, ninth grade algebra that, and then it just carries on and it kind of reconnects in that first year college algebra, um, which is a shame because a lot of talented students could really be some, you know, probably have some great ideas in their mind and not able to be able uh, to have an opportunity to, to work on those things. Are you tired of all the emails and phone calls from colleges that you never even heard of? Sign up to Where'sMyDocs.com and only work with the colleges that you choose. Where'sMyDocs.com, where college recruitment is made simple. topic um i find this is extremely interesting because um i have two two younger boys one in middle school and there's this new math that is a, a very an a old actually an old math right um but what he's being taught is very different from what i learned and uh um math was my thing coming coming up right i i made it all the way to cal two and then me and Cal two had some uh some 
knock down drag outs and uh, I end up losing. But <laughs> um, going through school, high school, all the way into college, math was really, really my thing. And one of the obstacles that I face um, as a parent um, or even as someone who's helping a younger generation with this so-called new math, um, they're only, you have to learn it this way and there's no other way to learn it, right? Um, so how are you uh, helping students do that or just talk to what that looks like um, from a perspective of trying to help um, <laughs> young minority students do this, do this process? Uh, I hate I hate to uh, to say this, but I don't fool with it at all. <laughs> uh, people have asked me like, "Are you a tutor?" Like, I don't I don't tutor because I've been away from the subject matter. Like, I would say I'm a coach. I can show you the strategies to get you through because I know the general concept. But I'm always in conflict with this new math. I because I don't know if the new math has caught up with the old professors in college, mm. right? And yeah. so I, yeah. it, 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 there's a group of students that are gonna be caught in this loop who's stuck in this, I have to do it this way. And then you have professors who've learned our way and it continues to clash. So I haven't, I have theories and, and I can probably get on a soapbox about what that is, but I think it boxes our students um, because really once you get into the calc and even some parts of college algebra, it's all about theory and reasoning. And um, I know they, they're into this way of proving how you have it, which I kind of like, but they never tell students of why they need to do it. They just make it feel like it's a penalty. Like you have to show me that you didn't cheat. Like, no, that's not it. You just, they want you to be able to say, I did X, I'm Y, I plugged in Z, I did this, I did that. They want you to be able to explain yourself, but they never tell our students why this is going to pay off in the long run and so students just kind of bs their way through that part and never take it so um the best thing i can do is connect with um they usually have parent math nights they have resources on the web they have videos khan academy um i think has really great videos that you know students can look at parents can look at and getting it um yeah, I don't, I don't know if I'm the greatest person on this because I don't <laughs> I don't like it at all and I don't get it and I'm still curious to see how how that plays into um, ACT scores, even though it's kind of like fading away and their performance in their first first college math classes. That's awesome. I like what you just said because when you're talking about plugging in X, Y, and Z, I think to me when, when you you can that's the to me, the beginning of creating a robot versus the future entrepreneur, like, like how that is approached, right? You, Because it's not one way to approach anything like old math, new math is still the same answer. And so it's just, that, that just speaks volume. This is why, um, another reason why I wanted to get on because all that segues into like your B prepping, right? And, I, and, and talk about that and talk about how that came about. Yeah, so my my businesses have had some iterations for a long time. Um, I did start off primarily like my focus was taking everything back home um, to Amy. We didn't have summer camps. Well, we still don't have summer camps. Um, we didn't have after school programs. Um, it just wasn't. You know, if you if you know Amy, you know Amy because of football. You know, it's because Alabama stops stops at our back door every time they head to the Sugar Bowl or they have to pass through Louisiana and they recruit our students. And then, well, Devonte Smith is, is our Heisman. He came from Amy, but he's one of the few uh, scholar, true scholar athletes to have come from um, our city. And it's a shame because we have so much great talent but the academics aren't there and they're led to believe that they can go on a football scholarship. And I've often have to tell young men, it's like, there's no such thing. I've been an administrator. I've, I've had to talk through scholarships and budgets. There's no such thing as a, a football scholarship. Mm. Football has some money. If they have the grades and they qualify for regular admission scholarships, they're gonna combine that together and that's what they're going to call a, a, a athletic scholarship. Yeah, there's there's no such thing. Um, 
And so I wanted, I wanted to focus more on academics, not just for one, for the, the athletes that are have potential coming out of the city, but two, for the people, for the students like me who weren't athletic inclined, we were in the clubs and the organizations, like who's going to support them? Um, and then the parents, like my parents, they, you know, they didn't go to college. They uh, finished high school. My mom's a, a LPN, so she had some some post high school education. Um, my dad and my grandfather were the real hustlers. Is where I get it from. They they uh, both drove buses. They uh, they my well my grandfather owned rent houses and dump trucks and uh, they just had like hustles. My dad painted painted cars for a while to get me to college. Um, after that, he sat down for a little bit and, and now he's catering and cooking, you know, it's a, <laughs> it's a range of things. So I'm like, well, what can I do? Cause I don't want to live this nine to five life forever. I like what y'all had. Um, and so I'm like, okay, so what can I do that? I, I'm not, I'm, well, I should, I'm not going to sell the, the insurance and do all of that. I'm not a great salesman. Like I want a business that connects to my passion. And so um, I started with the tutoring and a little bit of tutoring some areas, but I really focused on ACT prep as the hook to do college coaching. Cause they were like, oh, my, my baby's smart. She's fine. Her college, her counselor at high school helping her. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, we'll see how this is going to work out. Um, but I did it for those parents who said, hey, Aaron, my baby's graduating. He needs some scholarships. Ma'am, it is March. He's graduating two months. There's no scholarships to be filled out. <laughs> he waited too late. And so I wanted to start hooking them into the idea that college is serious enough where you have to invest some things in your student in this side of education. Like everything's not going to be free. It's on a sliding scale. It's any it's in comparison to like East Coast and West Coast and probably the northern. Um, college counselors who are, you know, dedicated to wealthy white families who charge $100 an hour and who's focused on admissions essay to, to Ivy Leagues. Like, no, I want to coach students for what we need here. Yes, I do want to send some students to Ivy Leagues because I know their potential and I want to expose them, but I really want them to find the right fit to make the right choices so they can make it through. Um, and so that's how that's how Be Preppy got started. I wanted something, uh, when I was looking at most of my clients, they were teachers, they were um, middle to low income parents, but who were willing to invest in their students. And they know that uh, they needed some support that they couldn't give them. Usually first gen, sometimes, you know, teachers, they, they're educators themselves, but their students have, don't listen to them at all. Um, and so I would come in and be that voice of reason between the two. So that's how, yeah, that's how Be Preppy got started out of a need to just serve this part of our community. That's awesome. Again, you're listening to the Educate You podcast being brought to you by My College Draft, where education is due money. Today, we have a special guest in Dr. Aaron Wheeler. Dr. Willie, you bring in some really good information. I, I, again, which we have this thing where we were even like on a previous podcast, we were talking about the difference between purpose and passion, right? And if you don't mind, you know, give us your diff, your definition of both and what's the difference between the two. So I feel like passion can burn out. So passion is slightly overrated. Um, I grappled with this question a long time because I wanted to figure out, like I couldn't connect the dots. I couldn't figure out, Aaron, you want to work in higher education, but you hate, <laughs> you, you hate, you hate being stagnant. You hate slowfulness. You hate slow to change. You hate boundaries. You hate nine to fives. You hate, you hate all of this. You really want to go work at Google, but you have no Google talents. <laughs> Um, and so I tried to put all these pieces together, like how, like, why am I the person who wants to start a business, but also wants to be a, a little bit an administrator somewhere to lead, but who want, like, I couldn't reconcile that until um, I found the theory of, or the concept of Ikigai. It's a Japanese concept. Um, and it loosely translates to what, it, you know, why do you wake up in the morning? Um, and so it has 
it has it's like a Venn multiple Venn diagram. So at the center is purpose um, or your icky guy. And so you have your vocation, you have um, your mission. It's like what the world needs, and you have um, your profession, what you actually like went to school to study for, and your vocation is like the talents and what you're good at. Um, and I, I was like, okay, well, I have all these things. How do they mesh? Um, and that's what kind of led me to say, okay, I like empowering people. I, I want to, I value uh, innovation. I value, uh, you know, me being self, you know, independent and self-reliant. And I don't like micromanagement. Like I started to figure out what I wanted and it all came together. It's like, I like to empower people. I love, this is the crux of why I'm in higher education. It doesn't matter um, you know, if you're going to college, I just want you to do something that you, you want to do, you set out your mind to do. Um, and so that's kind of how I found my person purpose. Now the passion, um, I think it burns out for me, like people are still calling and say, Hey, are you still doing ACT prep? That's, that's not my area anymore. And I feel like I'm not, um, that's like, I don't get any joy from doing it. One, just because of the, the whole theory of it too, because of the pandemic. And I think it caused a lot of colleges to rethink that. And so I want to work with students in other areas, but that's burned out for me. And my new passion, but still in the, in the realm of my purpose is productivity and success coaching for professionals. As I've seen my mentees grow up, I'm now meeting them where they are, which is you know, post-grad uh, in that funny, awkward 20-something age that we all struggle to 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 do with life in like I like that part and then and just uh becoming on my own as a leader I love developing new professionals um and so that passion has switched and but still in that realm so talk about go wiser David mentioned that that process right so can you can you talk about the process of developing go wiser and talk about some 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 obstacles that you overcome in order to get it done because that's one of the things that a lot of us have we want to do a book but <laughs> man that first page is, it, hurts. it hurts well okay so I'll, t- I'll do a juxtaposition on the first book go wiser and the second book live wiser two totally different different kind of writings um so go wiser it was something that like uh, one i was unemployed <laughs> That was the key. I was unemployed when I wrote Go Wiser. I started it when I was getting frustrated with my job and I was like, I need something to distract me from this mess. So I started outlining what my chapter. So that's the first thing of it. Just put down everything that you've been thinking about on one page. It doesn't matter how it looks. It doesn't matter how it sounds. Just put it all out there and then organize. And then take each idea and write from that idea. It may not even be the same title you've given it but at least you have like some goal marks that you set for yourself and so I use the outline so uh you know did the outline it was may have been seven chapters and so it's like okay let me take this first chapter you know write it knock it out the park I want this done in two weeks or a week um and so I just you just have to keep setting some goals some goals for yourself and you can't overthink it because you you just have to say this is the first draft and that's my issue I want my first draft to be a 98 percent I just want you to add a little period you know add a little comma that I missed and call it done I don't like anything I don't like to see red I don't like to see huge revisions and so I get stuck when I was like no 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 no, no. I'll go back and erase and so I had to get out and say Aaron call it done write the first draft you can Once you're typing it, you can clean it up then. So I did a lot of handwriting um, and I still have the notebook. I did a lot of of handwriting on on people's couches because when I came from Kentucky, I hadn't seen a lot of people. So I wrote, you know, visit my sister for months, visit my best friend for months. And that's how I I wrote that book. That came easy for me because I had already done it. It was in the bag. It was, I was confident about the information. I knew I was the expert. you know, I didn't have any preconceived notions. It's my first book, put it out there, whatever. The second book, Live Wiser, was a lot of 
of things that I had just gone through, you know, career transitions, figuring out if I really wanted to stay in higher education, trying to figure out my next phase, getting frustrated at the, just the whole system of job hunting in higher education. Um, a lot of are still fresh. And so that was really hard. This time I had writing partners. Um, Ashe is, our, is, is the imprint that we created to, to write our books. Um, and so they became my writing partners and they knew me from different parts of my life. So they challenged me. Um, and so, you know, when I heard like, mm, this, this is not going to cut it. I was like, man, forget it. This book ain't never going to come out because <laughs> I just, I put it down for a long time. I had just started my new job. And so that was, you know, a whole nother thing. The pandemic happened. I was like, oh, I'm going to get some work done. But then I was just too tired to write at night. And so it was really like a, this book was supposed to come out um, last year, but it was just so like, I just couldn't get through some parts because some parts were so personal and it made me reflect on things. And I'm like, well, I don't want to tell, I don't want to write this book when I'm angry at life as an adult and then tell students to be okay. And like, I couldn't reconcile that. So um, that, it was a little bit challenging because I was a lot more transparent. I was still going through a lot of the things um, I didn't like, you know, I'm, we're all getting through this adult daunting thing, but at different stages. So, you know, I'm still learning and I didn't want to, I knew I, I had some expertise in some areas. So I needs to have a fine print of, um, do you know this to be true? Uh, are you assuming it to be true? Or did you actually go through this, Erin? And I had to sort that out. So both, I mean, both approaches, it just depends on where you are, but it really does take you getting out of that, out of your own way, out of your head and just write, just, just write, like just rant. Sometimes you just need a good rant to just put it all on paper. And I was like, oh, okay, I got that out of my system and threw it away and I started over. And that might've been the chapter that you would read today. Um, so yeah, so just that's the, the process is getting started is the hardest part. But then once you do that outline, you get your title, your working title, you get, get that outline and just write chapter by chapter, put some limits on yourself. Say, I need to get this done in three months. That means I'm gonna either write a certain number of pages or words or finish a chapter by a certain day. And uh, that's how we would coach um, any person who wants to write a book. Okay. Um, uh, I need some shameless plugs real quick. So what, where can we go and get this? this book at what uh what platforms is available yeah so go wiser uh, secrets to college success this book is perfect for seniors in high school first year students and even sophomores who barely got off their first year who need a reset um and so that book is really good for them it just tells them why they need to do certain things while they're in college so they can end up on the right side after college graduation live wiser is perfect for a uh, junior, senior, or anybody post-grad, like even uh, anybody who's, it could be 30, 35, it could be 10 years post-grad, it could be somebody who just went back to school to get their degree, um, but it talks about how we view, um, it, how we view a college degree, and that we have to rethink that it's our t meal ticket for life, like no, it's just a part of it, not even a quarter of it, it's a piece, it's a foundation, um, but it also talks about finding purpose and, um, you know, things we need to know about money and, um, and just how to, to be proud of your journey and how to navigate <clears throat> life. Like, what's the mindset you need to navigate life? You can't avoid the obstacles. So how do you, how do you, um, how do you take those and make them into opportunities? So uh, Go Wiser is on Amazon and Live Wiser is in pre-order. It'll be out on Amazon on my birthday, June 20th this year. Um, but you can pre-order my on my website, uh, AaronRWheelerPhD.com slash shop. And speaking of the, the last, the last, the, like your, the site that you said, you said AaronRWheelerPhD.com because uh -huh. I want to talk about vision because you definitely sound like a visionary um but i know sometimes people get blurred vision because things get in the way and it and it prohibits them from pursuing so talk about vision and how you pursue vision in the midst of and then segue into aaron r wheeler phd.com 
Yeah. So uh, I, so, okay. So about two years ago, as now as three, um, I realized that I have great ideas, but they weren't necessarily a full vision. I realized I was taking care of everybody else from church to sorority to family. Everybody else was getting, was benefiting from me except for me. And so about two years ago, I decided to shorten my vacation, my Christmas vacation with my family. I used to spend like two weeks with my sister in Mississippi. Um, I shortened it and I was like, okay, these days, the 26th through the, like the, the, the first, or the 29th are going to be my day to actually sit with my thoughts and plan for myself and actually have some breathing room to actually see ahead, um, see full pictures, see, see everything and put it down and plan it. Um, and so it wasn't until then till I, I could see like I had the time and mental energy to see more than just ideas. Um, and sometimes as professionals, we never have that time. And so if you don't give yourself that time, that's why we, we never, we can never gain the momentum to change our situation. So that's what happened. And I just began to focus more on, like, I felt like everything I wanted to do was always late, uh, put together really quickly or rushed, or I had to miss it because I missed my window. Um, and so I just started taking that time and I've opened up this retreat to other ladies. Um, to help them get the time to focus on themselves. And so all that you see uh, the between the book, the website and all that I'm doing, I had to take that time to put it all together, make it make sense for me. Um, and so it's just not, oh, you're just doing something here and here and here. And it just so, it seems so random. I wanted it to be a, a concentrated effort of like, Aaron, who do you want to be? What do you want to do? And when do you want to do it? and just do it. Like you, you can slice and dice and spread it out and make it fit your whole life, but you need that time. Um, you need that time to yourself to actually do the work. And so that's the hardest. It's like adult onset ADHD kicks in <laughs> after 30. We can't sit down, we can't focus. And so that's even, you know, regulating a group of professional women. I'm like, y'all, y'all have to stop the chatter. Y'all have to like think and do like actually put the dates down because actually putting the dates down is scary. Oh, we we gonna have this book written and oh, oh wait, I'm gonna put this on my calendar. Yep, put it on your calendar and do it. Um, and so again, vision for me uh, is practical. It's not some theoretical construct. It's, it's it's how you see it and and the things you do every day to work it. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. So so in the spirit of women empowerment, uh, mm -hmm. close. Can you? For, for these su super sisters in the making, can you give them some words of encouragement, some future deltas? <laughs> oh my goodness. So uh, the first thing I would say is be true to yourself, be authentic. Don't be afraid to be who you are um, and make sure that you take the time out for yourself. Like you, self-care is more than just going to the spa. Um, self-care is healing, self-care is uh, reflecting, self-care is getting uh, your needs met mentally, emotionally. So go do the therapy, do the work on yourself to be happy.